Good morning. Um, I'm sure people saw the program and felt that one Mr. R. Parthasarathy with a lot of white hair and a lot of wisdom in his words and heart will be present. Uh, he is my senior. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it because he held up in a part heard matter in Chennai in a different city. So I'm in his seat and have very big shoes to fill. But let's see what I can do in the next 15 minutes. So, of course, the theme is navigating the interface between IP and competition law. I'm not going to spend too much time on general information, but I want to give a basic introduction to why the debate arises. I think the moderator made a very key statement at the beginning that although sometimes people feel that the objectives of the two law are apparently contradictory, in reality they actually merge at some point because fundamentally both are ultimately for consumer welfare and to improve competition in the market. But I'm going to give you a basic idea as to why this issue arises under the Indian law and I'm going to focus on two specific issues that are currently ongoing before the Competition Commission of India, the watchdog in our country, on where this interface is playing a major role. So the basics, uh, you basically have three different parts in the Competition Act. One is called the merger control, which we are not dealing with here. That's about when two companies merge and become a super company and what types of regulations apply there. The two other points that are dealt with under the Competition Act, one is called the abuse of dominance. The other is, called, the other is basically restricting anti-competitive agreements. The difference between the two, just at the very top level, is abuse of dominance is something where you question the unilateral conduct of one party. Right? You say there's an entity which is in a particular market at a dominant position and they're abusing their dominance for their private benefit. So it's typically unilateral conduct. Whereas in an anti-competitive agreement, you're talking about at least more than one player because you're talking about an arrangement or an agreement between two parties, say to fix prices or to, you know, there's a cartel form to fix prices to limit the amount of product being supplied in the market and so on. The interesting point about the Indian framework is when it comes to anti-competitive agreements, the law itself says that notwithstanding whatever I've said is illegal as an anti-competitive agreement, if the agreement in question has been put in place in, in order to keep reasonable restrictions for the protection of intellectual property rights, they are not to be considered as in breach of competition law. This exception is written into the Indian law itself when it comes to agreements or arrangements between two parties. But the other provision that I dealt with, which is the unilateral conduct, there, there is no such exception. You will see in the next slides as we go that fundamentally these issues of interface between IP and competition law are arising in the case of unilateral conduct where this exception is not mentioned in the law. One thing that we have to know ultimately, this is just a general point for everyone, that they have very, very wide powers. They can issue any types of orders that is required, the CCI watchdog. And typically they will impose a penalty for any violation, which will be a percentage of your turnover. So whatever turnover you've made, they're going to put a percentage of that as a penalty that you'll have to pay. There are cases where it's 800 crores or 500 crores or 300 crores and so on. So. The greatest debate that is on right now ongoing is the SEP debate. SEP here refers to standard essential patents. Everybody may have heard of these litigations ongoing in India, where Ericsson has sued several players, both Chinese and Indian, for infringement of their patents. The unique thing about these patents are these patents allegedly cover certain standards that form part of your 2G, 3G, or 4G technology. So everybody who uses a phone you will see the 3G, 4G symbol. They're all standardized technologies. Some of the patents cover these standardized technologies. Ericsson started infringement suits against several players, and they've also obtained interim injunctions and so on for 2G, 3G, and 4G. The unique thing about an SEP patent or a standard essential patent is they're generally covered by what is called as a FRAN commitment. A FRAN commitment is a commitment by the patentee in the relevant organization, they make an announcement to the world fundamentally that these are the patents that cover these standardized technologies, but because they are standardized and the purpose of standardization is to proliferate this 
standard or this technology across and make them interoperable. Any of my patents covering this technology, I hereby give a commitment to license it to anyone who's willing on a fair, reasonable basis and a non-discriminatory basis. So that's F-R-A-N-D, right? This is the fundamental principle of FRAND, that if I have a patent covering a standardized technology, I give my commitment to a willing licensee, whoever wants a license, on a FRAND commitment basis, on a FRAND basis. These initiation, these suits were initiated in India because attempts were made to give a license to these companies. But for whatever reasons, the negotiations didn't work out, or the parties didn't agree to the proper terms and conditions. After these injunctions were obtained, the parties losing the interim injunction, they went to the CCI, saying that what they're doing is an abuse of dominance. And one of the major points that they made in that complaint was the royalty that they are asking in these negotiations to give the license are excessive in nature, right? And there are a lot of patents that are essential for the implementation of standard, and there are some patents that are non-essential for the implementation of standard. But in order to gain a higher royalty, they bundle the essential patents with the non-essential patents, and therefore forcing me to take technology that I don't need and forcing me to pay royalty that I don't have to pay. That's the allegation, fundamentally. The normal procedure before the CCI is, first the CCI will do an examination without hearing the other side or so on, just to see, is, is there a case made out? Is this something worth investigating? This is what we call as a prima facie order. The CCI issued a prima facie order. And one of the things you will note in the manner in which the CCI issued this prima facie order was they said, Hold on, Ericsson's got patents on some technology that goes into the chip, which is inside the phone. So the smallest scalable unit, which contains the patented technology, is what is contained in that chip, which is inside that phone. The chip and the phone are at different prices. End of the day, the chip is just a raw material that goes into the phone. So the phone is priced differently from the chip itself. But why is Ericsson saying that my royalty is X percent of the phone and not the chip? They so said, prima facie, there is something uh, suspicious about this because I would normally think that I'm entitled to a royalty on the patented technology and not on what is not patented. The entire phone is never patented by you, so why do you take the royalty base as the phone and not the chip? And they also mentioned that if fundamentally you are in a dominant position in the market and you are supposed to give a non-discriminatory licenses to anyone who seeks a license from you, why do you execute non-disclosure agreements with everyone? So if, uh, if with licensee X you've agreed to certain terms and conditions, but you execute an NDA, which means neither party can go tell anyone what the royalty terms are. So when Y comes along saying that, all right, you also give me a license, Neither party can tell why, what are the terms I agreed with X. So how do you determine that they are non-discriminatory if you don't tell or share this information with each other? That's what the CCI says, that's not what I'm saying. This is what the CCI says. So based on that, they initiate the investigation. This was immediately challenged before the High Court. Hold on, these are patented technologies. They are regulated under the Patents Act. How can the CCI determine whether or not I have to license the technology or the rates at which I have to license the technology? Fundamentally, I have an exclusive right under my Patents Act. So there's no question of the CCI trying to interfere with my exclusive rights. So they do not have the jurisdiction to deal with these matters. I am exclusively governed under the Patents Act. I am not governed by the Competition Act. In the ruling that came out recently last year, the Delhi High Court originally ruled that is the incorrect interpretation of the law. Patents Act and Competition Act, they do not exist separately. They are not contradictory to one another. Definitely there are issues of overlap, which means I cannot give a ruling that the, anything that is regulated by the Patents Act is automatically excluded from the Competition Act. The court denied such a ruling, and they said that therefore the Competition Commission is entitled to continue investigation. This was immediately challenged on appeal.
and on appeal, a division bench of the High Court, which sits on appeal over the single judge judgment, essentially says that this order of the single judge is now stayed, which means presently, although the CCI is conducting the investigation, they are not entitled to issue a final finding as to whether there is abuse or no abuse of dominance. They have to wait till this two judge bench of the Delhi High Court determines whether the CCI has jurisdiction to look into patent matters. So this is a very fundamental question that is now pending before the two judge bench of the Delhi High Court. And as you can imagine, whichever party loses this Delhi High Court proceeding will definitely appeal to the Supreme Court. So until actually the Supreme Court gives a final ruling on this fundamental issue of whether IP issues can be dealt with directly or indirectly by the CCI, this issue is going to be in limbo, at least for at least another year or a couple of years. The other interesting point that has become a major issue recently is enforcement of intellectual property itself is being challenged as a violation of Competition Act. So in the SEP case, the issue was not the enforcement of the patent. The issue was you enforce the patent based on some negotiations that were based on excessive royalties or abusive terms and conditions. That was the allegation and that's what is pending. Here we are one step before. Can someone question the very right to enforce my patent? So in the US, for example, you have the very famous Neuer Pennington Doctrine. It's, I think, a 1960s judgment, which will essentially say that when I use a legal machinery to enforce a legal right, I am exercising my right to freedom of expression, the First Amendment in the US Constitution, and they are therefore guarded. The Neuer Pennington Doctrine says somebody cannot be questioned just because they sued someone else. That itself is not a ground. This is an interesting case where there was initially a suit for trademark and design infringement in the Delhi court. So somebody filed an uh, infringement suit saying that this person intends to release this product in the market and release of this product will amount to an infringement of my design and trademark or copyright. So therefore, please injunct me. The court granted an injunction and this proceeding went on for a little while and ultimately what happened was the parties in that litigation made a joint application to withdraw the injunction. So the injunction was lifted. So the injunction was vacated. Then the party who had suffered the injunction, they moved the CCI saying they have intentionally timed the suit, specifically at the time when I was initiating the marketing efforts for my product. And ultimately, this injunction is vacated. Whether with consent, without consent, doesn't matter. You ultimately vacated the injunction. So the whole thing was done in an abusive manner just to make sure that I don't release that particular product or at least delay the release of my product or launch of my product. So this is bad faith litigation. They never had a case in the beginning. They suppressed material facts before the Delhi High Court and got the injunction by suppressing some important information. And when they realized that they suppressed the material information, they agreed for withdrawal of the injunction. This is all bad faith litigation just to stop me from releasing the product, just to make sure that my product release was delayed. So when they went to the CCI, CCI once again issued a prima facie case. They said, yes, in the above facts, this is something maybe that's worth investigating. Let the director, director general investigate this and submit a report within 60 days, and we'll find out if there is abuse or not. Once again, the CCI's decision to investigate the matter was challenged as being outside the jurisdiction of the CCI because it involves IP case. And the same orders that we may saw in Ericsson applied here also. That let the CCI continue with the investigation, but until the time the High Court decides whether I can, whether a CCI can even investigate into such IP matters, they will not issue a final order. So this is what the CCI says. And another, there is also another investigation. This was the JCB case that we discussed. There's also a similar investigation against ABB, which is also on the exact same point that an injunction, this was in Bangalore instead of Delhi. Injunction was applied for in Bangalore, a city civil court got an injunction, and then they found out that this entire litigation, according to them, is in bad faith. 
there was no basis for initiating infringement litigation and so on. The difference, I would say, is the, when it comes to the Competition Act in India, we are at a precipice right now. Nothing is clear under the terms of the Competition Act, unlike in jurisdictions like US and EP. They've been debating these issues for years and years together. There are very old 1900s and late 1800 judgments from the US Supreme Court also on issues dealing with Competition Act and the Sherman Act and the interface with intellectual property rights. The jurisprudence is reasonably well settled and what you debate today in the US are at completely higher sophisticated levels. They will be fine tuning the ingredients and so on. We are at a precipice where we don't even know what the ingredients are. I don't even know how to prove that something is an abuse. I don't even know what is specifically anti-competitive. We are at that precipice. Whether it is good, bad, or ugly, normally you will say, I will first do kindergarten, I will go to first grade, I will go to second grade, then I will do my masters, then I will do my PhD. Typically, issues of interface of competition on IP are at somewhere the masters or the PhD level. You've got to start with the basics from somewhere. But for good, bad, or ugly reasons, at the very precipice, when Competition Act is still being understood, you've got all those issues at the top level now being flooded into the CCI. And in practice, you can understand that CCI is not typically right now in that position to fully appreciate the logic. We've got cases directly going to high court. It's not as if the CCI is able to sit and decide on the matter and reflect on it because the moment CCI starts an investigation, there's an immediate challenge before the High Court saying, hold on, the CCI cannot investigate it. So the High Court is also sitting on the matter. So there are hundreds of brains in a very disorganized manner who are still at the kindergarten level on competition law, discussing debates at PhD level on the interface between IP and competition. So it will take some time to settle. It will take some time for people to appreciate the consequences of ruling this way or that way. So my conclusion on navigating the interface of is bad luck that we are all operating at this time. You have to be patient. If you are patient for the next couple of years and maybe four to five years, you will have a better presentation saying, all right, this is how you navigate the interface of IP and competition. Until then, if you have any questions, I'm ready and over to the moderator.